say the game is getting old. Monday morning and your coffee's cold. Life is not what you want it to be. You need another chance to be who you want to be. Hello, everyone, and welcome to A New Direction. My name is Jay Izzo, and ho, 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 ho. Not another great show. No, it's not a great show. This is an unbelievable, fantastic show. Because you know who I have with me today? Leo Botari. Yes, I said Leo Botari. He wrote this book. And I know you podcast listeners and those on, you know live with us right now at CastBox FM cannot see this book. But this beautiful orange book with the blue shades on the outside of it. It's called What Anyone Can Do. It's an unbelievable, fantastic book. You're going to love this book. You need to buy this book. This is not just a business book, first of all. This is a book for your life. This is a book for your career. This is a book for your business as well. So everybody who's listening, there's going to be something in the show that Leo Botari is going to share with you that is going to help you become more successful than you are today. And the things that he's going to say in this book that I, I tell you, I read it from cover to cover and I read some of these sections more than three times because... They absolutely are going to challenge you, and they are going to help you grow. I'm just telling you right now, and it's absolutely fantastic. So we're going to talk to uh, Leo Botari here in just a few minutes. But let's do what we do every week, right? What we do every week is that we walk you through the four areas of your life. You know, I believe that we are four-part people. We are physical people. We are mental people. We're emotional people. And we're spiritual people, right? And I want to check in with you because every week we check in together, and we kind of go, well, where, where am I at, right? So on a scale of one to ten, one being miserable. 10 being outstanding, right? Where are you at physically, right? How you doing, right? If five is average, right? How are you doing in there, right? And then you got to ask yourself why. Are you, why are you that number, right? You're not feeling well. You know, you're not taking care of your body the right way. You know, what's going on there, right? And then, then the next question is, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to get to that next number physically, right? Do you need to take another walk? Do you need to maybe cut back on the chips? Maybe cut back on the sodas? Maybe cut back on the sugar? Yeah, I know. I just said cut back on the sugar, right? It, you know, maybe you got to stop eating some of that stuff, right? Because some of that stuff is not making you healthy. So where's that number for you? You got it? All right, good. There's your first number. All right. Second number, where are you at mentally? And what do I mean by that? What are you consuming in your brain, right? What are you consuming in both halves of your brain, right? The right side of our brain is the creative side of our brain. The left side of our brain is that logical side of your brain. How are you feeding your brain, okay? Are you feeding both sides of your brain? Are you doing things that are creative? Are you doing things that are logical? You know, show like this, I say it every week, a show like this works both sides of your brain. It helps you think creatively. It gives you some logical things. Leo Butari has done a ton of research on this book called What Anyone Can Do, and it's a ton of research. So there's logic to his, what he's going to say. Not only is there logic, but there's also going to be things in this book that are going to help you maybe go, man, I need to step outside of my comfort zone, be a little bit more creative. Maybe I need to talk to a few more people. Mm, uh, that was a hint. Uh, that was a teaser right there. So on that scale of one to 10, one being miserable, 10 being outstanding. How are you feeling feeding your brain mentally? You got that number? Same questions. Why is it that way? And then what are you going to do to change it, right? And think about this. Whenever I give you, you know, you come up with a number, I'm not asking you if you're a four, I'm not asking you to get to a 10. I just want you to get to a five, okay? Or, and if you can't get to a five, get, get to a 4.5, okay? But, but you're always improving, right? Always be improving, right? You're always growing. All right, so you got your two numbers. Let's look at the third area, right? Emotions. Right? How are you doing emotionally? What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean emotionally is how well are you able to control your emotions or do the little things kind of tick you off, right? Do you know what I mean when I say that? Right? Sometimes, you know, emotionally, you know, what happens is the little things get in the way and then we blow up emotionally and we can't control it and we can't, we seem to get out of control, right? But, you know, we can be really intentional about controlling those emotions, right? That's something that we can actually do. Sometimes we call it an emotional intelligence or emotional quotient. But not only is it controlling your emotions, but how well are you able to relate to the emotions of others, right? That's the, that's the other question, right? Are you able to tune into other people's emotions? So how are you doing in that area of your, of your life on a scale of one to 10, one being miserable, 10 being outstanding? How are you doing emotionally, right? You got that number? Okay, we got three numbers, right? And that leads us to the fourth area of your life, spiritually. What do I mean by that? Well, 
you know, we can't explain everything with science. We can't explain everything in emotions. We can't explain everything mentally, right? There's just all this other stuff out there that keeps us centered or that we believe in or that we have faith in or that we're convinced that, you know, this is what brings me back to my own sense of being able to understand the world. And some, for some people, it's God. For some people, it's nature. For some people, it's karma. For some people, they believe that they are their own God. And so they have faith in themselves. But we all have faith in something, right? And you say, well... I don't know that I have faith in anything. You do, because you have a reason to wake up in the morning. So you believe in something, even if it's yourself, right? You believe that there's something else out there, right? And we always do, and we're always searching for that, right? So I always ask people, where are you at with yourself spiritually? You know, how are you doing with that? And, and, if, and if you do have a relationship with God, how's that going, right? And if it's, if it's nature, how's that going, right? The point is, what's that number between one and 10, right? Where are you at spiritually? So you have your four numbers, right? You got your physical number, your mental number, your emotional number, your spiritual number. And then, you know, it's kind of like the legs of a table, right? So if, if the legs of the table are even and you have a plate and you're trying to eat, well, that's awesome. But if it's uneven, what happens? The plate slides off, right? By the same token, if you're sitting in a normal chair and then the table's too low, what does that tell you? Well, it's also hard to eat from that table and be healthy. So the whole goal here is to bring up all four areas of your life equally and get them to the right level. And this leads me to my next guest. And my next guest is an unbelievable, awesome person. I, I love, I've, I've never met him face to face, by the way, but I, just the way he writes and everything that he says, I've perused his website, by the way, Leo Botari. And Botari is spelled B-O-T-T-A-R-Y. He is an author, he's a keynote speaker, he is a workshop facilitator. He, his specialty is the topic of developing peer advantage for high-performing teams and peer groups. He was, for six years, he worked at uh, Vistage Worldwide. He led the rebranding of the company and directed a thought leadership initiative on the power of peers, which resulted in a book prior to this one that he co-authored entitled The Power of Peers, How the Company You Keep Drives Leadership, Growth, and Success. He is, serves as an instructor for Rutgers and Northeastern Universities. Prior to that, he was an adjunct professor at Seton Hall, and uh, he, he won the adjunct teacher of the year for college and communications there. He is known worldwide as literally being a leader in the idea of peer-to-peer relationships and how to grow. And I call him a success trainer because that's ultimately what he is. And so, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, would you please welcome Leo Botari to the show? Leo Botari, welcome to A New Direction. Thank you so much. Um, You know, the brief conversation we had just prior to get on the air today, I already feel like I've um, known you for years. And so I'm looking forward to just a wonderful conversation and I'm uh, just really excited to be here today. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you. I really appreciate that because, you know, the show is about, you know, all the friends. And by the way, I just want to thank everybody on CastBox FM and Facebook Live, Paul Fitz, uh, Joel. Thank you uh, guys for just joining the, the all the group, Linda, uh, Gosh, you guys are just all over packing the show uh, live here. So I want to thank all those folks. And certainly you folks are going to be listening to the podcast. I thank you too because, oh, and by the way, I got to thank Australia, my newest country to start downloading the show. And I need to thank them as well for um, Australia. You, I don't know why it's taken us so long to get to you, but somehow now we're got to you. So we really appreciate you. And Leo Batari and his book, What Anyone Can Do, is brought to you by Inline Business Brokers and Advisors. They partner with business owners when it's time to sell their businesses. So when it's time to sell your business, contact the professionals at Inline Business Brokers and Advisors, and you can learn more by going to inline.com. That's E-N-L-I-G-N.com. And also Linda Craft and Team Realtors. I don't care where you're at in the world. Linda Craft and her team can help you find the right real estate professional to help you Um, sell your home or find your next home and you can learn why they are known for being the legends of customer service but they've been doing it for 34 years and there's a reason why so check them out at lindacraft.com that's l-i-n-d-a-c-r-a-f-t.com and the t-shirt shout of the week goes to the island athletic club this is my home away from home club when i go to the beach uh, this is a place i love to work out and they are awesome and i appreciate jen case and all her people and all the folks there who make me feel so comfortable and i get a great workout every time i go down to the island athletic club and we appreciate them as well leo the book uh what anyone can do first of all i love this book i told you that off the air i loved this book because it challenges us on a number of different ways. And I told you before we got on the show, I'm probably going to play a little bit of a devil's advocate because as I was reading this book and about what anyone can do, one of the things that first came up for me was, well, this is more than a business book, 
And then it was, man, this is more than a life book. This is a, this is a book. This is a career book. If people want to change what they're doing, it literally starts with what anyone can do. So why don't we just jump into that real quick about what do you mean when you say, what do you mean what anyone can do when it comes to success and, and growth? You know, the, um, the line actually comes from a book that Joe Henderson, uh, who's a former editor of Runner's World Marathoner for a number of years, uh, wrote back in 1976 called The Long Run Solution. And in it, he was looking at people who are really successful, and he said, you know, the more that I look at these people, they're not capable of, you know, leaping tall buildings in a single bound and superhuman things that none of us can do. He said, for most of them, they do the things that anyone can do that most of us never will. And I think it was really a, just an interesting way to think about the fact that within us, if we have the daily discipline and, and uh, are intentional about, um, you know, what we're doing and can follow through uh, on what we're doing, we can do some great things. I happen to think that what anyone can do is surround themselves with really good people uh, who can provide them advice, encouragement, and support. And when we do that, when we enlist the help of others, we will do the things that anyone can do far more often. And I think thus increasing our um, you know, chances for individual success, whatever that may be for us. Um, you know, I loved actually your check-in at the, at the top of the show. Um, you know, there's a lot of peer groups out there. Uh, you've mentioned, of course, that I work for Vistage. You know, at every Vistage meeting, there's a check-in. And most of the groups, for example, look at, all right, where am I in personal? Where am I in business? Where am I professionally? And what they mean by that largely is, um, how am I growing as a leader? What am I reading? What am I doing? What am I taking in that uh, maybe takes me out of my comfort zone, right? And does those kinds of things. And then finally, it's health. And when I look at what you're talking about in terms of how are you physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, I think the more that we're part of a community, right? The listeners of your podcast are part of a community who keep these things at the forefront. And the more that we do that and know that even if we don't talk to you know, other listeners necessarily all the time, just the idea that we're part of a community that – uh, thinks about those things and can keep those uh, top of mind, I think is extraordinarily helpful. We can support one another in ways that I think are truly remarkable. And when we do, I think we're capable of so much. I, I agree with you. And, and I, we are going to talk about peers here. I, 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 I'm, again, you know, I told you kind of some of the things I was going to do with you here on the show. When, when you, when I read that first part about you reading the book, because you, you, people should know that you ran marathons, right? Yeah. So so part of the reason why you were reading the book was because you were trying to learn more about how to be better as a marathon runner. Sure. Right? And so uh, I, I think it, the, in, what's interesting to me is the journey that you went on that kind of creates this uh, to me, this impetus for you and for us. Um, thankfully, as you you know wrote this book, what anyone can do. But hey, it's available on Amazon, your favorite bookstore. So pick it up, what anyone can do. Um, but I thought, you know, so often we get caught up into, especially when I speak in at, at conferences, business conferences, or you know, if I do life coaching or whatever I'm doing at the time, people are always looking for a silver bullet solution or a magic pill solution to how do I become more successful, right? <laughs> And, yeah. and it's really simpler. It's 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 not a magic bullet. It, there, it's and it's not formulaic, which is what I think you were really saying when you said it's what anyone can do. I think that's right. And part of this, this there's nothing prescriptive about this book. There's nothing that right. tells you here's what you should do. Uh, what we're really just talking about is providing people a, a framework that they can help make work for themselves and their own lives. And I think that that is. You know, an effective way to allow people to make it work for them. Um, right. You know, you mentioned about running marathons. That's certainly, you know, you, most people, um, it's not a normal act to go out and run 26.2 miles. <laughs> no, it's and not. It requires, and it requires a lot of preparation. But what's interesting about it is when you follow a program and you just do those things that you're supposed to do every single day, it's incredible how you can get yourself both physically, emotionally, 
<laughs> spiritually, uh, you know, and mentally ready, because it takes all four of those things uh, to be able to get on the starting line that morning and be able to run that race. And but it really is it's it's the daily discipline around those things. And and the more that we can, again, you know, all the time, even when I was running, maybe I would go on training runs by myself, but I was always checking in with my buddies who may be running the same race. Uh, and we talk about, hey, how'd your run go this morning? What did you do? What are you thinking about? What? Uh, how do you how do you encourage each other? How do you answer questions for each other when maybe somebody has a tough day or they're feeling a bit of an injury or whatever it happens to be? And that support. Uh, is so important because too often left to our own devices. I mean, I know you read uh, in the book, uh, University of Scranton did a study basically looking at people and when it comes to the failure rate of their New Year's resolutions. And right. essentially 92% uh, of people when they declare a New Year's resolution will fail it. And, and think, consider this. Most people aren't making New Year's resolutions like they're trying to make the Olympics or something like that. They're just trying to lose five pounds or they're trying to do something that – most people would consider fairly realistic and yet too often left to our own devices we'll get off to a good start and it's like nah i don't know if i feel like doing that you know and um so i think this idea of if we're really serious about whatever it is we want to do uh enlist the help of others you know put a little plan together something's realistic for yourself and then just have at it you, you know i I think there is sometimes, uh, and we're talking with Leo Batari, uh, author of the book, by the way, for all those people who have joined, joined us, uh, What Anyone Can Do, uh, How Surrounding Yourself with the Right People Will Drive Change, Opportunity, and Personal Growth. Uh, available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, favorite bookstore. If they don't have it on there, ask them why, uh, because they should have it on there, and tell them you know, we want it facing out, because it's a beautiful covered book, by the way, too. It's not just a great book to read. It's also, it's also a very good-looking book as well. One of the things that you you impressed upon me, and I had this thought process going through, and it starts in chapter one when you say, no one does it alone, so why should you? Um, actually, did I say that right? So why should you? Yeah, I think I said that right. There you go. Sure. So, um, but I think sometimes people want this belief. I, I've fallen into this belief system of, well, I think I can do it on my own. Right. And and so I I think, you know, part of this whole New Year's resolution thing, right, is that so many people will go in there, go and they do it by themselves. Right. And there's zero accountability. So if they if they make a resolution, they don't tell anybody. Right. Or they don't have people who can hold them accountable or people who will join them in their fight. Then what inevitably happens is if they fail, well, there's no consequences. Right. Or right. th- there's no there's no cheering section, right? And or, and there's no booing section either, you know. So, why do you think it is that we're so reluctant sometimes to bring people aboard with us? I think it's making that kind of public commitment, and it's scary. Mm-hmm. I think it's scary to a lot of folks. Um, they are uh, just reluctant to just kind of put themselves out there and say, "Hey, this is this is what." Uh, I'm trying to, to get done. So it's easier just to, you know, kind of do it in secret, hope for the best. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, on one hand, there's, there's no consequences, but there is a consequence from a standpoint mm-hmm. of assuming you declared some kind of a goal that you actually did want for yourself and then you don't do it. Well, that's a pretty big consequence. It may not be public, but you realize that for yourself that you didn't do it. And it doesn't always necessarily give you uh, or put you in a great place for the next time you look to set a goal for yourself. And, you know, allowing yourself to to fall back, not do what you said you were going to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I think it's, it's just part of how we are brought up at a certain level. You also brought up this notion of doing it by yourself. Yeah. And I think, in part, we have to redefine what that is. Okay. So, for example, I remember years ago when uh, my daughter was looking for a job, and she was, and she had a really good network, and she had some people that she knew and who she built a, some trusting relationships with, and had built some currency with these folks. And I said, "Well, you're going to call them and let them know that you're applying for the job." Oh no, no, I got to do this on my own. I said, "What in the world says to you that?" leveraging people who you've earned their trust with is somehow not doing it alone. Like what, what, what does that mean to you? Um, it's, it's kind of like 
taking your leg and chaining it to the chair and then deciding, okay, now I'm going to go run that marathon. Now. <laughs> it's idiotic, basically. It's like, you know, we've got resources and assets that we, um, you know, have, have invested ourselves in. And, and we also, by the way, it's not a one-way street. The point, as you know well, uh, with this book is the expectation is that it's not only we ask others for help and helping us achieve our goals, but we're going to be equally generous with all the people around us to help them be successful. And that's really the power of it. So what, do you, what does Leo Botari say to somebody who says to you, I don't need anyone. I, I, I can do this. I, I can do this all on my own. I don't need anybody to help me. I, I got this. What do you, I mean, I'm sure you've heard this question before. I'm sure that somebody has said that to you sure. at, at times. What do you say to them? I would say, how about it? If that's <laughs> no, really? I mean, I you know, that. bottom line. So there's a couple of things here. One is I'm not suggesting that there are no people on this planet who aren't incredibly self-disciplined, who really don't need necessarily the kind of support to help them do those everyday things they need to do. There are certainly people like that. I think for most of us mortals, however, um, <laughs> we, we are helped by enlisting um, the support of others, certainly. So, uh, you know, I don't really have any issue with someone who says, hey, I'm going to take this on and, and or, or probably is not even talking to me about it because they're going to—they're just doing it on their own anyway. Yeah. Um, and I think there are certainly people like that. And but at the same time, we are—I I think our chances are better. Let's face it, um, and we are stronger when we have the help and support of others. I, I, I could not agree more with you on that because I—I I think what we forget is that—and you make a point of this in the book. And, you know, the book is entitled What Anyone Can Do. Uh, and great read, by the way. One of the, one of the points that, you know, you really emphasize here is no one who is successful has ever done it alone. I mean, Steve Jobs didn't do it alone. I no. mean, I mean and, and, you know, you know, Richard Branson has not done it alone. No one has who has reached any success. I mean, Warren Buffett has not done this alone. You know, he it, it, it's just, just he didn't do this by himself. He surrounded himself with all sorts of people. All these people surround themselves with people. And I, 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 to me, and I know this isn't a recipe book, but to me it's part of the recipe of success is, and I think you make this point over and over and over again in the book, and that is, you, you know what? We're kind of designed naturally for relationships anyway, right? And it's kind of a give and take relationship. So if you if we're going to be more successful, we've got to enlist more people into our circle, the right people certainly, into our circle, in order for us if we want to achieve that type of success. I'm, well, the right people part is key, and you, you know you brought up something else too when you used the word peers, and we've been talking about. Um, if you think about the power of peers, right? That was a study into how and why formal peer groups for business leaders are so effective. The following year after that book came out, I had a podcast called The Year of the Peer. So it had definitely had a beginning and an end, right? Because we're looking at 2017 as the year of the peer. And I had about 50 guests on the show, all incredibly successful and all answering the question that you just talked about in terms of, hey, did you get to be where you are and do it all by yourself, they all laughed at the idea of it. Um, and what happened throughout those conversations over a year, and, and as you know, so much of their insights and thoughts are you know, woven into the book, the conversation for me shifted from peers mm. to the whole circle of people who surround us, our teachers, our parents, our mentors, our kids, that whole circle. And also from just formal peer groups in that setting, to how can we do a better job of just in our everyday lives enlisting the uh, help of others, surrounding ourselves with the right people, which I think, you know, you just made that point, which is really essential. And in and, and doing that, and I think it makes the topic far more approachable, far more relevant, as, as you've pointed out, to everyone. And I do believe that it is what anyone can do. I think we all have the capacity to surround ourselves with some really good people. And when we do, they can be extraordinarily valuable to us. And my hope, of course, is that um, you know, you'd be valuable to them as well. 
We're talking with Leo Botari, author of the book, What Anyone Can Do, How Surrounding Yourself with the Right People Will Drive Change, Opportunity, and Personal Growth. Outstanding book, uh, available Amazon. Uh, there's a Kindle version of it. It's, I'm, I'm holding the hardcover right now. It's uh, absolutely a fabulous book. It's not It's not a terribly long read. It's actually a pretty quick read. Um, you'll see that I've got all sorts of dog ears on my book. Sorry about that, uh, Leo, but I just had to save so many different sections uh, okay. of the book. Speaking of that, by the way, the audio book will be available on August 13th. Oh. So you don't even have to know how to read to be able to do this. <laughs> you, you can just... Or, you know, and so many folks, it's so fascinating because they say, you know, I just love to listen to things like this in my car yeah. and on my commute and be able to take advantage of that. And, um, you know, so the power of peers had an audio version, the audio version of this book, which will be available, I'm sure, on Audible and, you know, other sites will be um, August 13th. So, so. F- so, folks, you heard it here. I don't know if it's, we're first, but we've got to be early on. First. We're the first. To, so what we're going to do is when, you know, I write a post a blog post of the show and that you can also click on and you can listen to it directly. So in the blog post, if you go to jizzo.com and you go to the podcast section, when you go there, I will also have that on there in case you're wondering when the, when is that Audible book going to come out. It's August 13th. I'll post that in there along with, of course, Leo Batari's website where you can get his um, video of the minute of the, the, the um, what, 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 what anyone can do minute. And uh, which, by the way, has some great videos. I went, I just, I got so sucked into that black hole of watching Leo's. You can binge watch, yes. In, in, in a half an hour, you can see all 25 or 26 videos there. So there you go. I did. I, I got so sucked into it. Like, I'm going to be honest with you. I got sucked into watching you give me the minute. And I go, I want another minute. So I watched another minute. And then I was like, can, Leo, can we do the any, any, what anyone can do five minutes? Because I'll, I'll take five minutes of you. So I, I really enjoyed that. By the way, I do need to do this too, though. But Leo, Leo Botari and his book, What Anyone Can Do, is brought to you today by inline business brokers and advisors are you a business owner at some point you're going to need the services of an experienced business broker selling your business is a big decision so make sure you build your deal team starting with the experts at inline business brokers and advisors and you can learn more online by going to inline.com that's e-n-l-i-g-n.com and linda craft and team realtors no matter where you're at in the world they can help you find the right expert to help you sell or buy your next home. And if you happen to be in the Research Triangle Park, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill area, you can walk into their office personally and find out why they're called the legends of customer service. And they bring you Leo Botari and uh, his book, What Anyone Can Do. And August 13th will be the Audible book for those of you who I know love Audible books. And so uh, you'll be able to listen to him do that as well. Did you read your own book, by the way? Sure. Sure. I, I do that too. I read my own books when I when I do that. I, I read my own, but I love doing that. I think people want to hear my voice, you know, because I speak like you do. And oh, <laughs> I, that was really funny. I actually, I literally read both books a- after they came out. Did I do the read for Audible? Oh. I did not. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. I, I think there's various schools of thought on that. I think I would have liked to do it for this particular one. But I also certainly understand the value of a professional voiceover uh, as well. And actually, the uh, gentleman who um, worked on my book, his name is Jonathan Yen, uh, was just an amazing guy who was incredibly thorough about pronunciations and about just all kinds of things that I felt were, um, you know, captured a lot of the, the details of things that I would have paid attention to and yet will will have his voice rather than mine on it, which I'm sure will be an improvement. So I'm excited to hear it. <laughs> I think you have a great. I think you have a great voice. I think it would be. I I'd lo- I'd, I think you would have been great reading your own book. But that, that's just my opinion. So let, I'm going to talk about it, the there was there was in the second chapter of the book the power of exploring, discovering, and expressing what you want. We have a really hard time knowing what we want, don't we? Oh yeah. Yeah. The um, Laura Goodrich wrote a book, as, as you know, called "Seeing Red Cars." Yeah. And it was the, probably the first time I became kind of acquainted with this idea. I mean, we all know it, but then once you're reminded of it, it's a big, ah, of course, you know, we've all done it a million times. The idea that someone says, hey, Leo, what do you want? And I'll say, well, what I don't want is such and such, <laughs> right? And, you know, we've heard that from people uh, on countless occasions. And I think, again, for us, it's really difficult to just say, 
here's what I want to do. You know, whatever it may be, however small or however large, just just to kind of put that out there and be willing to put a stake in the ground and say something like that. Right. And yet for this is, you know, we think about surrounding ourselves with the right people. Well, who are the right people? Well, it kind of depends on what you want to do. Like if I want to learn a language, if I want to learn how to play golf, if I want to run a marathon, if I want to learn how to be a chef, I'm going to surround myself with people who can help me do those things. Right. Um, and they're not always going to be the same people. Yeah, I I think it is, as a psychological professional, I, I always find it very, I, I always find it interesting when you ask people like in a career, you know, sometimes I'll coach people in their careers and I will say, so what do you want? And if they really have a hard time telling me what they want because they don't, they don't know. I And I think, and it's true of me, by the way, I, I mean, I have to be honest here. I don't always know what I want. I know what I don't want. Sure. Right. And you know, some, and, and I'm not saying that that's bad. Knowing what you don't want is, I think, is really important too. Because I think if you can get enough of the what I don't want, you may be able to have a picture left of what it is you do want. You know, I, I don't, I don't know, but I kind of think that way a little bit. But how do we get people? How do we get people to do that? How do we give people? To, is it? Do we need to encourage them to really sit down and say, you know, really examine what you want? How do we get them there? I think part of it is we always don't even understand what our options are. Mm. I mean, think about it. How many times, t- t- even today, do you still learn about somebody who does a career and makes money at it? And you're like, really? Like, that is the coolest job. Right. And you never heard of it. it was, it's was it been so off your radar. You didn't even know people did that. And somehow you're constantly discovering ways that people are making a living, whether they're working inside of a company somewhere, whether they're um, a solopreneur, whatever it happens to be. And I think we're constantly, you know, part of it is if we can remain open and really curious and continue to ask questions and continue learning, the more informed we start to become about what is available and one might align with our specific strengths that we have and our things that we love to do. Mm. And, um, you know, so I think that's a start. Yeah, I, I think there's something else, though, I think I caught in your book when it came to this that I thought, you know, we maybe need to enlist some people, you know, the right people, of course, around us, maybe to help discover ourselves a little bit, right? Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I, I think, and I, you kind of allude to that in the book, like, you know, maybe you don't know what you want, but you know, if you talk to the right people in your groups, right, and go, okay, look, and, and I'm just I'm just making this up as I'm going along here. But let's say, you know, you're, you're trying to make a career decision, right? You, or you're changing careers or whatever it is later in life. And you kind of go, you know, I don't really know what I want to do. But, but if we enlist people that we trust and that we know and we have a safe place who will tell us the truth, maybe they can identify some things for us, right, in those peer groups that allow us to go and say, oh, I never thought about that. I had this skill. Because I think sometimes we don't even know what our natural gifts are because we do them so naturally we don't even know for sure what it is and that actually could because other people see it in ourselves and we don't but again we can't do that with other people without other people right no i think that's an important part of that exploration discovery process i mentioned and it's enlisting uh in in the help of others it's engaging in conversations about these kinds of things it's asking about what they do and how they found it and, you know, in most cases, I mean, think about all the people that I had on our podcast and when the, when it was, um, you know, the year of the peer, right? 50 guests, all of them, all these incredible vocations, right? All these great things they were doing. Most of them, you know, I, I interviewed one woman, uh, Tina Martini. She was an intellectual properties attorney. Well, I don't think when she was five, she thought to herself, hey, I'd like to be an internet intellectual properties attorney when I grow up. <laughs> Right. There had to be some level of like finding out and kind of the journey that she went on to find out that a career like that existed, number one, and that she would have a passion for it and have an aptitude for it and be really good at it. Um, so uh, I, I think it's a it's a journey for all of us. And the more we can understand other people's journeys, the more uh, I think you uh, remember you talked about Steve Jobs before and you remember the very famous commencement address that he delivered at Stanford and in it he talks about connecting the dots going backwards and it just shows us that in our lives we will do things learn things that we don't imagine are ever going to be relevant 
ever again and for any reason. And lo and behold, 10 years later, 15 years later, somehow those experiences and those learnings find their way into uh, informing something that makes us better at whatever it is we do decide to do. And it's, it's a great stuff and it's what makes life so wonderful. You're so right. And, and by the way, for me, it was over 30 years later that it happened. I mean, literally, literally it was something, I, I was a 0.75 in college my first semester. Now, I wound up being on the dean's list the last four semesters and went to grad school. I just, this past year, I did my university's commencement address. Right? Nice. And, and it was all because those experiences of overcoming, which has been kind of a consistency in my life of doing stupid and then having to figure out how to overcome it, even though I'm like beating myself up for some of those things, they wound up being the very thing that created so many other things. Because the, of those lessons that I learned about that I could give to other people to go, I don't care what you've done. I, I've, I, have, I have messed it up and have come back, right? And you don't think about that at the time. You know, when I'm a 19-year-old, 18, 19-year-old kid with a 0.75 and your dad is looking in your eyes going, son, I don't know that college is the right place for you, right? You're not looking at that experience as having any benefit to you, no. right? I mean, you, you're, not. you're not. And and yet, you know, then all of a sudden you turn that thing around. Well, what is it that I do, right? You know, I, I in, try to inspire and motivate people to do it. And I have a show like this that brings people like you on. Uh, by the way, his name is Leo Batari. His book is entitled What Anyone Can Do. And, I, and, and what we do here is we try to encourage people and help people find a new direction in their life. And it was all inspired because of something, this dumb stuff I did. What's funny, you know, we have the What Anyone Can Do podcast now, and most recently I had uh, Forbes publisher uh, Rich Colgar uh, on the show. Rich also wrote the foreword for The Power of Peers, but he just wrote a book recently called Late Bloomers, and it describes exactly what you're talking about. Uh, and, and, and as a society, we are often so obsessed with early achievement and, mm. you know, um, these kids, we're trying to get kids to do so well so early and do all this other stuff when they're, everyone's just trying to figure it out. And, uh, you know, so his book is really rather uh, remarkable. And I, I think you'd enjoy it, by the way, I, I, especially I, given I think you have a very shared experiences because life for Rich Carlgar didn't start out all that um, on what you would consider him boarding the success train in his early 20s either. So. Yeah, no, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I trust me. I really do get that. I want to talk about this this the piece in the book that we we we've we've danced around it, but we haven't really dug into it too deep. And that is the right people, of getting the right people around us. When you say in your book the right people, what are you really saying to people about who are the right people? So the right people could fit into a few different categories, right? Okay. So let's say you would brought up marathon running, that I may want to run a marathon. So I'll probably want to surround myself with some people who have done it before, some people who share the goal now, maybe have never done it before, but we can go through the journey together. Um, I may surround myself with someone who's never run a, a marathon, but they're just genuinely a really positive person who I know will be incredibly encouraging. Uh, you know, all along the way. So I'm looking for technical advice and expertise. I'm looking for some empathy. I'm looking for uh, people to that I feel are in my corner, kind of rooting for me, uh, making sure that if this is a goal that's important to me, that they are, you know, in it uh, in that way. So I think about making sure that you're not being surrounded by naysayers or people who are, uh, so into their own lives that they don't really have time uh, to help anyone else. You know, all of those podcast guests that I talked about, every one of them, if they weren't able to pay back the people who spent time with them and helped them in their careers, uh, they pay it forward uh, many fold uh, to people and to a person. Uh, they all do that and they understand the value and the importance of that. Um, and um, so I think they're, the right people are those people who are first and foremost, I think, pretty selfless uh, and people who will be positive and encouraging and can help us with the specifics as well. 
about whatever it is we're looking to do. Yeah, you know what I what I also heard in all of this is you need a diversity of people. Yes. And and it, one of the things I think you really make a really big point in this book in the book. By the way, the book again is called What Anyone Can Do. Available on Amazon. Uh, by the way, August thirteenth, the Audible book will be coming out of this, but it's also available on Kindle. I'm holding the hardcover up uh, for everybody to see on Facebook, but uh, uh, those folks on podcast, it's an absolutely fantastic book. But you know, you you really do make a point about you need to get just a multiple perspective view it's kind of i i kind of envisioned it envisioned it as kind of this diamond with you got to have all these different facets to kind of come together so that you can get a better picture of whatever it is you're trying to succeed at or grow in is that no is that fair yeah yeah when you have all of those experiences around you and that's really what you're looking for it isn't always that you're asking people for advice or what you should do or not do or anything like that but i think anytime we can uh, have conversations and people can share their life experiences with one another how much we can learn how informative where it is and also how we can realize that with whatever struggle we may be having when we have challenges in our lives we're not alone you know, I mean, you know very well, you look at social media, you look at all, everybody's highlight reel is all over LinkedIn and FaceTime and um, or, or Facebook and, you know, every other social media platform. It's all everything's great. Everything's wonderful. And, um, you know, it isn't all the time. Right. No, it's not. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so uh, to have people who we can be real with um, and we don't have to put our best face forward constantly uh, is is really, really powerful and really important for us to have in our lives. And the more people in more places where we can be real uh, in that way, uh, it's um, it's just really nothing better. I love that you refer to it, and and this is why I I loved it, because you refer to it kind of as a dream team. And, and, you know, know, of course, we use that reference, you know, from Basketball Olympics, you know, when that was all developed. But... It really took me back to saying, okay, I need to develop a dream team of people around me that have these different perspectives, these different thought processes that all don't think linearly. Some think are going to think way outside the box, and I need that. I need people, right, like you said, who've been there, but I also need people who are going to tell me the truth, right? Yep. And and that are going to be dissenters, not, not, not argumentative, but will say, I'm not so sure. Right, and the people aren't going to agree with me all the time. That are people are going to call me out, or going to question me, or are going to play the devil's advocate. What if, right? And I, to me, I think that that's part of the beauty of what you were talking about here. Is and and I and I think you actually use the word that you know. Do we have the courage to actually do that? Right? Do you, I mean, it, it's going to take some courage for you to sit alongside and go, okay. You're going to do this, you know, but it's going to require courage, right? Or, I, I, miss- I think, you know, part of this comes from participation in formal peer groups where when people really want to lay it out on the table, I think it's both an act of courage and generosity. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it, it's so helpful to everyone else uh, when that happens, for them to realize they're not alone or when you're sharing something that are, they're actually unbeknownst to you or going through it uh, potentially at exactly the same time. So it's, uh, yeah, it's powerful. Yeah, we're talking with Leo Botari, the book, What Anyone Can Do, How Surrounding Yourself with the Right People Will Drive Change, Opportunity, and Personal Growth. Fantastic book. He is brought to you today by our sponsors, and they've been with us from the very beginning, inline business brokers and advisors. They are internationally known. They have literally helped thousands of clients in the sale and purchase of businesses. When it's time to sell your business, contact the professionals at Inline Business Brokers and Advisors, and you can learn more about them by going to inline.com. That's E-N-L-I-G-N.com. And Linda Craft and Team Realtors, and they are literally for 34 plus years have helped people sell and buy homes all over uh, uh, the world by either helping them match with the right real estate professional or by if you come to the Research Triangle Park, which is Raleigh, Durham, and uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, 
you can find out why they are known for their legendary customer service. There's a reason why been, they've been around for 34 years, and there's a reason why you will want to uh, meet with them as well because they are literally the experts and professionals when it comes to real estate. And you can learn more by going to lindacraft.com. That's L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T.com. So uh, one of the things in the book that struck me because I, when I was in grad school, I did some work in goal setting. Um, not a lot, but I was doing some research in it. And, uh, and I'm going to combine a couple things here because uh, one of the things is I think we don't understand goals very well. And I think you make that point pretty clearly, that we focus on the wrong thing. Yes. It's easy to focus on the outcome and not focus what it's – takes to make that possible. Right. Um, one of the things, as you know, talk a few occasions to talk about the University of Connecticut women's basketball team is just one example of, and there are many high performing teams out there. And I think when you look at the best of the best teams, whether it's in women's college basketball or college football or, or whatever it happens to be, I think one of the consistencies there is not only are the players incredibly accountable for one another, But the goal of every day they spend uh, in that program is just to get better all the time. So the goal doesn't become the national championship. It becomes the reward Mm. for doing what it takes to get better and better each and every day and to try to put a team together that is actually capable of working together so incredibly well that they become at the top of their sport. Mm. uh, So yeah so let's talk about that let's talk about this high performance teams because you give us you give us five things that you recognize in high performance teams that the first that the first one is that we've got to surround ourselves with the right people right have the right people right have the right people got to have a a safe environment yeah and it's kind of interesting when uh you know google just came out with a study well not just came out with it but it's it's been a work they've been doing for quite some time on teams and they talk about how psychological safety is so incredibly important you know for people people have to believe that they can be in an environment where um you know they can make mistakes and where they can be real and um you know, when I talk about it in the context of a group and in a safe and confidential environment, or you talk about it in a team in terms of, you, know, you can hire great people, but how, do, how well do they trust one another? Mm. What does that start to look like? So all of that becomes really central to making everything work. You know, we, we listed them, these five factors in the power of peers and really did it in the form of a list. Today, I talk about it much more as a reinforcing loop. It's having the right people. It's having that safe environment that you talk about. It's um, from the perspective of a team, it's about real productivity, hmm. right? So we get the right people. They trust one another. Are we doing everything possible to create the context for them to be super productive? Or in the case of a group, um, how valuable is their interaction in terms of the outcomes they get, uh, both in terms of the quality of the conversation and the discipline uh, around it and the, and the topics and all Uh, Fourth becomes that issue of culture of accountability. This is not accountability, being accountable to the leader. It's about being accountable to one another. And it's really accepting personal responsibility for the role that you play in a particular group or team that you, you you understand that your currency with everyone there is all about bringing your A game all the time because you know that's what they're doing for you. Uh, And then finally, it gets down to leadership is really the, the last one, and that, that servant leader who is there not only just to make the group or team more successful, but also to be the steward of those other four factors. They're constantly watching out and making sure that we've got the right people, that that is a safe and trusting environment, that we are being as productive and the interaction is as valuable as possible, and that we're doing everything possible to create that context for people to uh, you know, accept personal responsibility for um, their role on the team and to bring their A game all the time. And I think that is so common for when you look at the very best teams, they have all of those things clicking on all cylinders and it really forms that reinforcing loop, uh, as I mentioned, because uh, it, it's just, it just constantly um, gets better. 
you, you, I, first of all, there's so many pieces in here of, of <laughs> those things that I just fell in love with. But I, I want to go back to number two, and that is the safe environment thing. Because you actually found a study here. Well, actually, it wasn't a study. You were do you do these workshops, right? Oh, and, yeah. Right. And so, uh, by the way, you go to Leo Botari, and Botari is spelled B-O. T T A R Y. If you go to leobotari.com, and I'll have his link because he does these uh, workshops, by the way, that you can actually get him to come in and, and do, and, and it, they're fantastic. But you actually were doing a workshop, and part of you do an assessment and you break people up into groups. And what, what you started to learn was you started interviewing people about, you know, did you feel like the group was safe? And they would give you nines and tens. But then when it came down to the reality, of well, how open and honest were you? They said, "Well, it was about a five or a six." That's right. It, it's it's a little like the people who own a swimming pool, but it's just a decoration, right? Mm. Sitting there and it looks great. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, and it, you know, if you got in it, it would feel amazing. But I don't. I just I look at it. I stick my toes in the water. Maybe I I do whatever. And that's kind of the kind of the metaphor for what was going on with these safe environments. People understood it to be safe. They believed it to be safe, but because in many cases they know no other place in their life where they enjoy that kind of a safe environment, using it is a whole other ballgame, right? It's, it's to really be vulnerable and have that combination of generosity and courage that I mentioned uh, to do that is, is a taller order. And, you know, when you talk about these workshops, these are very much, they are assessments, but it's a complete self-assessment. I'm not assessing anything. I give them a framework. I facilitate conversations they have about what matters most to them, and, and they figure it out. And it's not only a very unifying uh, experience, but also one where at the beginning of a meeting where they might always be thinking about looking toward the leader, you know, to take care of everything for them. <laughs> Uh, they realize how much of it they all own, you know, by the end. And it's actually really kind of, uh, you know, fun to watch. Yeah, I, w- I want to tell you something. I enjoyed uh, so much of the, uh, some of the stories that you told. And you told this one story that had to, to deal with this whole idea of a safe environment where there was this lady whose husband had passed away and they started a, um, actually kind of, a, I guess it was a, governmental they got governmental grants to test drugs to make sure that they were safe and they did some kits right drug testing kits those type of things and when her husband died she decided to take over the business and uh you suggested to her about this peer group you know to do peer groups but she was reluctant to do it because she wasn't sure that as an entrepreneur she could trust other entrepreneurs Yeah, it it was actually not me who made the suggestion to her. It was someone else um, who did that. But I think one of the leaps that she had to make, too, was she was going to go in a room with a bunch of people that knew nothing about her business. Mm. The thing is, even though they didn't know anything about genetic testing, they knew a whole lot about how to run an organization. And she was about to step into the role as CEO, which was not the role she had played when her husband died. And she knew that she was going to need some help. And... You know, as that story goes, it was not only where she discovered the power of collaboration because she starts working with this group. They start to get to know her uh, a lot better. People were challenging her. But to your point earlier, when people challenge you, if you trust that that challenge is coming from a place of caring, no one's trying to show you up. No one's trying to make you look bad or whatever. They're asking you the hard question because they care about you. And they care about you wanting to be successful. And someone had asked her, hey, by the way, um, you know, you seem to be all all these scientists that are kind of thumb wrestling one another, basically, to see who gets the patent first. And it's this big competitive environment, right? Right. He said, what would happen if you got these people to work together instead of compete? Wouldn't you get a whole lot more done a lot more quickly? And all of a sudden, she has thought about it for a couple of days, goes back to her chief scientist, says, hey, do we have a couple of people who maybe we could test this with and see how it works? Well, yeah, they tested it, and it worked really, really well, and to the point where, you know, as you well know, you fast forward to 2016, it was about 18 years later, no longer did they rely on government grants. They had a completely different business model, and they now serve labs in 37 countries around the world. 
She talks about this as the power of collaboration. And I often talk to, about it to groups from the perspective of what really is going on here is you had one person asked her one question in a group meeting that totally changed the trajectory of her company and her life. And that everyone who comes prepared to a meeting and really is there for one another has the capacity to do that every time they get together. They can make those kind of differences. And this is where these groups, when they understand not only the, the environment safe, but that they need to dive into that pool head first if necessary. And there's going to be incredible value and benefit uh, for themselves and for others. That's when you really start seeing the magic happen. Yeah. I, what I found fascinating about that story was how how difficult it has to be to say, I've now got to trust people I'm actually competing with. I mean, I, I mean, literally, I mean, you, she, she, I mean, right. I mean, some of those people were actually competitors. Am I, was I wrong when I, how I read that? Yeah, they, they weren't competitors. Um, but I think anytime you're in a room with fellow CEOs and you're all running the company and all right. that there, there can be a certain, you know, competitive nature to, whose company's growing and who's leading and who's doing this and who's struggling and not and you know some of that but at the same time when you get a really good group together you can throw that all out the window and they're just there to help each other because the company that is struggling today will be the one that'll be thriving uh, tomorrow and then it'll be you that may need help from someone else so I think people tend to get that but in her case you know, she hadn't been involved in it for a very brief time. She was just kind of figuring it all out. And fortunately, uh, there was a case where people really were listening and really cared and really asked the hard questions. And as it turns out for her, someone asked her that one question that just changed it all. That's awesome. We're talking with Leo Batari. He mm -hmm. uh, wrote this book that we've been kind of dancing all around. We've been dancing all around the inside of it, actually. And uh, it's called What Anyone Can Do. It's uh, how, how surrounding yourself with the right people will drive change, opportunity, and personal growth. Available Amazon, your favorite bookstore. Uh, pick it up. It's an absolute fabulous read. It's, like I said, folks, this is not a long read. This is actually a very quick read. Uh, but it is chock full of examples and real life um just real life testimony of how people use collaboration and, and peer groups to become more successful. And uh, he's uh, he's outstanding. D d d are you okay for a couple minutes yet, or are you up against I, it? I am totally good. And I, the only thing I wanted to do is you talk about the, it. It's a, you know, I, I think it is a quick read and all of that. And part of what I'd hope to do with it, um, and to kind of underscore the approachability of the content is I definitely wanted to give a shout out to Ryan Foland and his oh, cartoons, which right. are on the cover and on every chapter. And I hope you enjoyed them uh, as much as I did when I first received them and we were assigning them to various chapters and all that. But Ryan did such an amazing job and he's such a talented, um, you know, at a lot of things, by the way. The fact that he does these cartoons is a real kind of uh, side thing for him. But um, just... Uh, it, I think it, it uh, gave a lot to the book. Well, I felt like he, I felt like his uh, illustrations set the tone for each chapter. Yeah. Because what I would do, this is going to sound, I don't know if this is going to sound bad or not, but I, I'd look at the picture, right? And I'd look at the title of the chapter and then I'd read the chapter and then I would go back and look at the picture and go, Ah, we go. Oh, that's clever. Well done, Ryan. That's actually really, really good because it actually the picture, the picture made sense. But then it even made more sense after I was done with the chapter. And so the illustrations were, I thought, were absolutely fabulous and were absolutely appropriate. And they were fun too, by the way. They they were fun illustrations, and I enjoyed that book. By the way, Leo Botari is brought to you today by inline business brokers and advisors. They represent profitable, privately held companies with gross annual revenues in excess of a million dollars. They're internationally known. They deliver the highest market value in the shortest amount of time with complete confidentiality. That is their registered trademark. So you can learn more by going to the international leaders uh, when it comes to business and sales. And that is inline business brokers and advisors by going to inline.com, E-N-L-I-G-N.com. And Linda Craft and Team Realtors 
doesn't matter where you're at in the world. And if you happen to be in Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, and the Greater Research Triangle Park, find out why they are the legends of customer service by going to lindacraft.com. That's L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T. And Leo Batari uh, is joining us and going to give us a little bit of overtime. I'm not going to keep him too much longer, but I want, I, I've got a couple of the things that are just chomping at me at the bit. Because one of the things you said in this book that is brilliant, by the way, is the leader as the backstop. Right. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit from your perspective. What do you mean when you say leader as the backstop? So what we're talking about there really was um, culture of accountability. And it, it largely spoke to, in that case, in that context, it was a formal group meeting situation where the members holding one another accountable, if you will. So this is not something that, you know, leaders oftentimes they want to be you know, they want to control things, right? They want to feel like I, I'm going to, I can, I can be kind of the, uh, the enforcer of culture of accountability, which you're just not going to make people do that. You know, you have to, you have to create a circumstances, create circumstances under which they will want to do that, you know, with one another. So the idea isn't to be the enforcer to the group and have it filtered down to the individual member. The idea is that a member who talks about a topic and, and confides in a group over something uh, during a meeting and takes a half hour of the group's time in order to do this would be the one who would naturally at the very next meeting say, hey, thank you so much for your time last week. Here's where I am with this, right? So they become, the, the, the individual member takes the lead. If for some reason that member, let's say, um, you know, gets a, phone call that was kind of disturbing on the way into the meeting or something like that and kind of takes their head out of the game a little bit. They might show up to the meeting. They don't bring it up. One other person in that group should be saying, because they're prepared, they knew what happened last meeting, should be saying, hey, Leo, didn't you, you know, talk about this thing? Where are you with that um, from last month? And then I'll say, of course. Well, if for whatever reason I don't bring it up, not one other member asks, asks the question, then that's when the chair kind of plays the backstop on that or the whoever the leader of the group and vistage they call it the chair. Um, that's when that person says, all right, Leo, you didn't bring it up and everyone in the group, no one asks the question. It's like, really? You know, that's kind of, we need to do a little better than that. And it's just a rem gentle reminder to them that it's on them when it comes to the accountability they share with one another. It's not something that can be forced upon them uh, by the leader of the group. So that's really kind of where that came from. I, I love that Hulk. I loved the backstop. I, I just, I was like, man, okay, how great is it to have a leader who is not going to, is not trying to push their agenda. It's going to allow the, this culture of accountability to happen, exactly. but is there when, you know, people are not willing to maybe call out Leo <laughs> and I don't mean call him out in a bad way, but to, sure. rem to, to but to remind Leo, you know, you said that you were going to commit to doing this, you know, a few weeks ago, right? And the, the, the leader okay. can say, you know, approach that now. All right. And you know, in most cases, in real, really, in all cases, in these group situations, this is someone who left the previous meeting, voicing something that they expressly wanted to do for themselves, mm. right? So again. No one's shooting them. No one is saying, you do right. this, you do that. You committed to this, that, and the other thing. It's a person says, all right, I heard all these great experiences. I heard all this stuff. My takeaway is such, and here's here's what I want to do with this. Now, now I have greater clarity about how to act going forward, and here's what I'm going to do. All everyone wants to know is, hey, how did it go? How did that work out? Not only from the perspective of, that person feeling, you know, some level of accountability to the other members. But if you think about it, it would, it's a huge learning opportunity lost when you don't follow up on what really happened, right? right. Because maybe that person ran into uh, some type of roadblock that no one anticipated when they were talking about the issue a month earlier, or maybe, you know, whatever it happens to be. But it's a, an enormous learning opportunity uh, gone when you don't continue to work with one another and follow up with one another and to do it as i mentioned from that place of caring because all we're trying to do is help people do what they've uh, expressed they want for themselves that, that's absolutely outstanding his name is leo batari and uh, before we let him go we're going to do what we do with every guest so as i'm promoting the book i'm gonna let you think about the next question i'm about to ask you leo so 
every person that I bring on the show, we become friends, and uh, we're no longer author to author. It's just two friends. Like I told you, we're at the we're at the kitchen, just munching and having having a glass of wine, having a great conversation. And by the way, the conversation I thought was great, and I appreciate you so much um, being on the show, and I'm grateful for that. And just your candor and for writing this book. This book is great. What anyone can do. Uh, that, uh, by the way, how surrounding yourself with the right people could drive change. So, Leo, thank you so much. But I always ask every person on the show, you know, the show is called A New Direction because we try to help people find a new direction in their life or their career or their business. If you could leave the listeners of A New Direction with A New Direction, what would Leo Butari leave the listener with? Are you talking about personally? Yeah. What would you leave? What would you? What? Yeah. What would Leo Batari leave the listeners with to help them find a new direction based on your book? What anyone can do. I I would say never believe that anything has passed you by. Mm. Um, don't be a situ in a situation. I had a friend of mine years ago. Um, he's probably in his mid thirties, and he said, "You know, I always wanted to learn how to play the piano." And I said, well, your fingers aren't broken. I said, if you want to, you know, go learn how to play the piano, go learn how to play the piano. And I said, and by the way, when we're 45, you'll have been playing the piano for 10 years. Mm. And he's like, huh. So he went and learned how to play the piano. Now he's been playing it for about 25 years. Mm. So, it, or the story I told about my, my dad becoming a, you know, a golf pro, you know, in his 40s at, at a time when everyone else was going through these PGA schools and they were in their early 20s at the time. It's, it's a real belief that, you know what, um, at least that we know of, we go around uh, this life one time, and if there's something that we feel passionate about, we're interested in doing, I don't care what age you are, what stage you're in, um, don't ever feel that it's passed you by. And um, you go take it on and, and be the best you can be at it. That's awesome. Please stay with me for just a second, Leo. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard him. His name is Leo Botari. You can find him at leobotari.com. That's L-E-O, of course, Leo. And then Botari is spelled B-O-T-T-A-R-Y. Check him out. He, I'm telling you, great stuff. His what, what Anyone Can Do minutes are fantastic. He's got a great podcast called What Anyone Can Do. You can subscribe right from Leo Batari. He also is a workshop facilitator. He is a, an international speaker. People love him. He's absolutely outstanding, so you can hire him. Uh, conferences, whatever, book him, right? And you can do that right there from Leo Batari as well. The book is available everywhere books are sold, so I don't care where it's at. And by the way, first on the show, right? Here it is, August 13th. You heard it right here first on A New Direction that the audible version of what anyone can do will be available August 13th. So make sure you jump on that as well and say hello to Leo. Tell him, you know, why don't you, why don't you go check him out and say, Hey, I heard you on a new direction. It was great. I enjoyed it. And I love your book. You're going to love this book as well, folks. That's the show. I just want to say thank you to Leo Butari, Botari for being with us. I want to thank all my listeners from all over the people who've been watching us live uh, thank you so much, uh, CastBox FM live listeners and Facebook live li watchers and listeners. I appreciate you doing that. And all my podcast listeners from all over the world. We're in 24, 25 countries now. Australia just joined us. And so I am so grateful for all of you all over the world who listen to the show. I, it, it, we never expected this to happen. We just went out there and we're just trying to help people. And all of a sudden, we're all over the world helping people. And I could not be more grateful for that. So I am thankful to you for not only listening to the show, but then recommending it to your friends. So thank you so much for doing that. I, I totally appreciate it. And my gratitude, I can't express it enough uh, because without you, we don't have a show. And so thank you so much. And to this great country, the United States, I want to thank all the people from all over the United States, from LA to New York City to Chicago to Austin, Texas, from Seattle to Miami and everywhere in between. I just want to thank all of you so much for listening to the show, downloading it, streaming it, and all the positive positive things that you give back to me. Uh, I, I am so grateful for that as well. Folks, you know what I say, right? Be inspired because when you're inspired, that means you can inspire someone else. And when you inspire someone else, that means they in turn can inspire others and that can make this world a great place. I will see you next week with a great show, with another great guest, another great book, and we're going to have a great time. So what do I say every week? Bye. Ciao, everybody. Your con
confidence And the answers don't make sense You got to keep your hope alive You got to know you can survive This is your time to fly A new direction, a brand new day A new direction, things are gonna change You can find the strength to go a different way, yeah The time has come, your dreams will take you places you never been before find your passion find your strength